All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, today we're doing a Japanese style curry uh, that I like to do with a little bit of white miso paste. Today we're actually going to do it with a little bit of doenjang instead. Uh, and I will explain to you what doenjang is and why it is different from miso paste and why it is also probably going to be fine to substitute them in between. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions for me, feel free and drop your questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know everything uh, about Japanese curry, but I know lots of stuff, so hopefully I can be helpful or informative or at the very least entertaining to watch. Uh, as with everything that we cook on these streams, uh, there is a recipe video that goes along with this one. That one, that, those will always already live over on my YouTube channel. Uh, so if you're looking for that stuff, uh, those are usually easier to follow if you're trying to reproduce the things that we're cooking. Uh, this particular curry is loosely inspired by one found uh, at Bizarre Cafe in San Francisco here in the Bay Area. Uh, so all that stuff, it lives over on the YouTube channel. Uh, we're working our way up to 5,500 subscribers by the end of the month. So if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal, please hop over and subscribe. Uh, so uh, kicking things off, so I'm starting off here uh, with some green onions, which you'll notice I'm picking a whole bunch of stuff off of them. That's because they're really old uh, and they're like essentially going bad. Uh, green onions, what I like to do, uh, because you'll notice they usually have these roots still attached to them. That's basically just the root of the plant, uh, which means that if you stick it in some water, it will keep for quite a while. Um, these are very old. These are like a, a week and a half old. Um, which means that they're going bad. Uh, so what usually the first thing that starts happening when you start seeing these these green onions go uh, is that they start wilting. So usually that happens at the ends of the uh, green onion. Then the other thing that will start happening is it actually just starts continuing to grow. So like uh, this little tiny bit right here, uh, that's just the green onion continuing to be a green onion. Uh, so usually what I like to do uh, when I start seeing it wilt is I just like to pull off that wilted part. Uh, like anything else, uh, it's gonna be fine. It does it's not. So, as lo sometimes it will start molding. If you do see it molding, uh, that's a sign that you gotta start throwing it out. And you're gonna be fine. Uh, and then the other thing that I like to do uh, is just sort of pick off these tiniest uh, little bits, these little tapered ends off. Uh, those tend to be a little bit more bitter than I would like. Uh, and then you've essentially got uh, usable green onions. They're not the most attractive. They're gonna be a little bit uh, like crooked. Uh, but for the most part, totally edible. So, those are our root ends. So I'm going to separate these. Yep. There we go. So, those are our root ends. What I'm doing is I'm separating these. Uh, over here, those are the greens of our green onions. And right here, what we're about to do is slice up the whites of our green onions. Uh, the reason that I'm separating these is because the whites of our green onions, uh, they tend to be a little bit more rigid and durable. Uh, which means that they are able to withstand wok heat a little bit better. You can fry them up uh, just like a normal onion uh, and it would uh, generally withstand that heat. Uh, whereas if we tried to do that with those greens, uh, things are gonna start. it's not going to be super attractive. Uh, then you're going to have like wilted green onions floating around in your curry, uh, which is never fun. So what I like to do, we're going to separate it. You'll often see me doing this uh, in a lot of recipes. Uh, just because we use green onions in a lot of recipes. Uh, so what I like to do is we're going to separate these. These are the whites, uh, which we're going to set aside for a wok fry. So those are going to go into our wok fry. So our curry, by the way, is going to happen in two different stages. Uh, so the first stage is essentially going to look like a wok fry. Uh, we're going to bloom some aromatics, kind of going to look pretty similar to every wok fry that we ever do on these streams. Uh, we're going to bloom some aromatics, then we're going to fry up some chicken. We're probably going to sear that chicken before those aromatics, actually. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to combine it with the wet ingredients. So that's going to be our miso paste, uh, some mirin, there's going to be some sake involved. There's uh, probably, I think there's some water and maybe some chicken stock if we can find it. Uh, all of these things are going to go into our wok. Uh, and then once that happens, we're going to use the wok uh, and it's uh, basically the polar opposite. So we're going to turn that heat down from extremely high heat uh, to essentially just simmering heat. Uh, and then we're going to use that simmering heat uh, to just sort of let that w uh, curry reduce. So uh, we were talking about this on the last stream too, actually, because somebody mentioned that they had uh, just cooked this recipe, which is cool. Uh, so what essentially what we're going to do uh, is we're going to let it reduce and then let it simmer. Uh, today, we're probably not going to let it simmer for super long. Uh, I know that the, somebody that I was talking to yesterday, uh, on Tuesday mentioned uh, that they let this thing simmer for a whole hour. I think, I think 
was a whole hour, maybe even longer than that. Um, I very rarely ever let this curry simmer for a whole hour uh, because I'm lazy and I don't want to wait a whole hour. Uh, but just like anything that's long cooked, it's going to be really, really tasty if you let it simmer for a whole hour. Uh, usually what I like to do is we're just going to end up simmering for probably about 30 minutes, maybe a little bit less than that. Uh, basically just long enough to make sure that our potatoes and carrots cook through. Uh, and then that's going to be it for our simmer. Uh, and that's going to be just plenty plenty of time um, to cook our curry. But if you're really committed, you could absolutely start this uh, probably a little bit earlier. It's 6.30 already, so it's dinner time already. Uh, and you can uh, absolutely slow cook this for a while. So that's our green onions. We just separated those. Uh, next up, we're going to get to our aromatics, which are the two ingredients that are in pretty much every recipe that we do. Uh, this is our garlic that we're starting off here with. So I'm starting as with all any time that we work with garlic, uh, I'm giving it a crush with the broad side of our knife, like so. Uh, and if you smack it really good, you're going to have to smack it really hard. Uh, when you're, don't, don't be t timid when you crush your garlic. Uh, it takes a real good smack, uh, like so. Uh, and then what's going to happen uh, is that skin, first thing that's very useful is that when you smack it real hard, uh, the skin pretty much just pops off, which is very useful because peeling garlic is really, really annoying. Um, that off. Uh, then the other thing that will happen, uh, actually even if you, if you smash it hard enough, uh, you really don't even need to do much chopping. Um, I still like to make it sure and run through it uh, with essentially a rough chop at this point. Um, uh, but essentially what's happening once you give it a real good smack uh, is all the allicin in the garlic is going to start releasing. Uh, and the allicin is where all of the flavor is. So um, You can think of it as sort of like garlic juice, like the juice of the garlic. Uh, that's what's going on when you crush it like that. So that's our garlic. Uh, garlic, by the way, also, uh, each clove of garlic, depending on how big the cloves of garlic are that you're working with, uh, they generally will have some sort of stem or like root end. Uh, it's, uh, some people uh, don't mind it. Uh, I generally don't bother picking it out, but if it really bothers you, you can absolutely go through and pick that thing out. Um, I find that, especially when we're wok frying, it doesn't really matter that much anyway, uh, because it's just going to start coming apart in the wok fry. Uh, but if it really bothers you, you can absolutely go in and pick that stuff out. Uh, next up is our ginger. I've just chopped off a few bits uh, that were looking a little bit pale. Uh, this ginger, by the way, is pretty old. Uh, I mentioned this a few times before, uh, but ginger it has a pretty long shelf life. You can keep it uh, in the pantry for quite a while because it's a root vegetable, so about as long as you would keep a potato in the pantry, uh, which I want to say is that like, you could probably keep a potato in the pantry for like a month or so, uh, and essentially, eventually it will start sprouting. Um, but the sprouting is not the sign that you have to throw it out. It's just a sign that you have to pick the sprouts out. Uh, but as long as it's not molding, which does eventually happen, uh, just like our uh, green onions, you're going to be just fine. Uh, so this particular ginger that we're working with is pretty old, uh, which is why I had to chop some some because not because it was molding, but because uh, it was starting to uh, dry out, uh, which is less than ideal. So we're going to do, uh, with our ginger as we always do, uh, this is going to be our fine mint. So I'm starting off, uh, this is going to be a rough dice, a large dice, large dice. Uh, then we're going to line it up and run our knife through it for our fine mints. Uh, this by the way, are there are many shortcuts to your garlic and ginger, you don't have to do uh, the, two, uh, the knife work that I just finished doing. Uh, most of the time, you'll, uh, if you ever see me doing this chopping, I'm probably going to do it uh, in lieu of any other kind of option. Uh, mostly because I hate cleaning dishes, so uh, if we just stick to the knife, then the only thing that we have to clean at the end of the cook uh, is the knife. Uh, but if you want, if you really don't like chopping stuff, you could throw it in a food processor. That's what you do when you cook it in large quantities at the pop-up, uh, the food pop-up that, that we run. Uh, that will work. Uh, you could also run it through a microplane. That would be really easy. Um, uh, the problem with both scenarios is that you now have to clean your microplane or your food processor, which is pretty annoying. It's, oh, it's not even hungry, but it's fun to watch. Thank you. That's cool. I'm glad that it's fun to watch. So, anyway, uh, that's our ginger. Uh, welcome, by the way. Hope and thank you for watching. 
Uh, that's our ginger. We're gonna set all four of those things aside. Uh, and this is gonna head into our wok fry very, very first. What we should do next? Let's do this onion. Uh, next up, so now we're gonna start moving down the line. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're gonna start proceeding down the line of our veggies here. Uh, so first up is going to be, this is half of a sweet white onion, which I almost thought I didn't have. So uh, what I'm going to do here, so we're peeling off the first layer and then what you'll notice here is uh, it's still attached to the onion right here uh, is the root end of our onion which is going to be very very useful because what we're going to do uh, is uh, slide, uh, slice the onion uh, with that root end still attached uh, and then uh, what you'll notice will happen as we start chopping uh, is that root end just sort of holds the onion together as we chop which is very very useful. Uh, my favorite trick with onions uh, because it helps us get this nice even dice going. Switch nuts real quick. So that's our onion. Uh, and that, that's essentially the large dice, I guess we would call that a large dice. Alright. Set that aside. Uh, next up, let's get to our root veggies. So first up today, uh, we have a couple of root veggies that are going to go into our uh, curry today. In my opinion, the two most iconic parts of a Japanese curry, uh, the potatoes and the carrots. Uh, I don't think, uh, I personally don't think that you can make a Japanese curry without those two ingredients. Uh, although I have seen many Japanese curries uh, that omit the, uh, the, the carrots. Uh, I actually think they're very, very important. Uh, so what we're going to do uh, is... Uh, what uh, what I'm going to do is I'm essentially putting those potatoes off until the very, very last thing that we cook, uh, cut uh, because they're going to start oxidizing as soon as we start chopping it, uh, which means that basically as soon as those potatoes have lost their skin, uh, the, the exterior of that potato is going to start oxidizing really quick, which essentially means uh, that once it gets uh, in contact with air, it's going to start uh, turning, turning colors. Usually potatoes, russet potatoes, they turn pink on us, so... Uh, so I like to leave them until the very, very end. Uh, if you'd work fast enough, you could uh, get away with not having to do anything else. Uh, we're probably not going to work fast enough to pull that off today. Uh, but if you don't manage to work fast enough, uh, the other trick that you can do is toss those potatoes into some water, uh, which we're probably going to do anyway, uh, because we're probably not work fast enough. Uh, but uh, what I usually say, uh, say is that um, uh, if you're working with russets and they're going to be sitting out uh, and like kind of staying on the counter for more than say like five minutes, uh, you probably want to put those in some water otherwise they're going to start turning weird colors on you. Yeah. So, uh, but before we get to all of that though, we're starting off with our carrots here. Uh, and what I like to do when we're working with carrots, uh, the first thing that you just noticed that I did, uh, that we sorted our carrots by size. Uh, so we're starting off by chopping these smaller bits of our carrots here. Uh, that's very useful uh, because then we can start uh, paying a little bit more attention to the way that we're chopping these carrots. So uh, for our smaller bits, you'll notice that I'm chopping it on a pretty large bias here. Uh, sometimes you might even see me chopping off the smaller portion of the carrot, which is not the most food con conservationist conscious, uh, food conscious, food conservation conscious. Uh, but uh, essentially what we're doing uh, is uh, doing our very, very best to make sure uh, that our carrots end up relatively even sizes. So, uh, if you're a real stickler about uh, even carrot sizes, you generally will have to start paying attention to which carrot you pull out of the bag so that they're all of the same size. Uh, I didn't pay that much attention, but we'll be fine. So here's what we ended up with. Here's our smaller bits. They look something like this. And then here's our larger bits, which are close in size. Not perfect, but close. Uh, yeah, let's get to it. All right, so next up is our potatoes. Uh, so we're gonna be working with today, this is some russet potatoes. Uh, and you uh, can absolutely use other kinds of potatoes too if you don't like using russets. Uh, the main reason that I usually work with russets is because I always have russets on hand. Uh, this like a good standard potato to just sort of keep in your pantry. They have a very long shelf life, just like those carrots. Uh, which sort of makes this curry a pretty pantry friendly 
uh, dish. I think the only fresh ingredient that we're using today was us green onions. So. Uh, but if you don't have uh, russet potatoes, you could use Yukon Golds. You could use... Um, I don't know, I can't think of any. <laughs> I can't think of other potatoes right now. Ooh, you made chamin and Mongolian beef. Yeah, uh, the Mongolian beef is one of my favorites. We actually haven't done Mongolian beef in a while. I haven't done beef in a while. Uh, mainly because uh, Angus steak is expensive and hard to source sometimes for me, so... Yeah, but yeah, that, those are two of my favorites too. Uh, I also haven't done chow mein in a while too. So that. I'll add it to the list. So what we're gonna do is, I'm, ta I'm taking these potatoes, as we're chopping them, we're gonna toss them in the sink. Uh, we're gonna work mostly fast enough uh, where we can probably avoid the uh, uh, oxidation, uh, as long as we work pretty quickly here. Uh, but again, if you're working slowly, or if you're not confident that you can uh, finish your potatoes in under, say, five minutes or so, uh, you want to get those potatoes going straight into some water. Uh, otherwise, they're going to start turning pink, which is, I guess, technically, uh, in this particular scenario, not the end of the world because we are going to be tossing these potatoes into a whole curry, uh, which is essentially going to turn yellow anyway, so it's not going to be the total end of the world. Uh, but if you're doing something similar uh, and you're making, say, like hash browns or something, which are not going to have uh, a long cook in anything else. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that they don't start oxidizing, otherwise you're going to end up with some pink hash browns, which is not fun. Not an attractive look for your hash browns. Yeah. Alright, so here's our potatoes. We're going to set these uh, up and we're going to start chopping these up. Uh, like I mentioned, we're going to get these into some water now that we're ready to start chopping. Uh, if you're really committed, what I have done in the past, I'm not, probably not going to do it today because I don't feel like it. Uh, but one of the big problems with potatoes, uh, especially if you plan on like pan frying them or wok frying them, uh, is that they seem they tend to taper off right here, which means uh, this tapered end right here. For one of these. Uh, this will end up starting to burn if you don't chop that off. Uh, today it's not going to be super important because what we're doing today uh, is it's just going to end up into a long cook, so we're not actually going to be frying it first uh, very in, in any real scenario. Uh, so it's not going to be that big of a deal if we leave that tapered end on. Uh, but definitely if you're doing things like home fries or if you're trying to do, uh, I think we I brought, brought this up the last time we did gamja joram, which is a Korean uh, braised potato. Uh, you definitely want to remove that tapered end. Uh, otherwise, it's going to start uh, burning on you. Uh, in our case, though, since we're going to be long cooking, uh, not going to be that as, as big of a deal. Yeah. Uh, is there any downside to the oxidation other than color? Yeah, no, really, just color. Uh, it's it's really not the end of the world. It's all it's really just a presentation thing. Uh, is that basically they're going to be pink, uh, which is why I say is like in our case today, not the end of the world if it starts oxidizing, uh, because even if it does turn pink, uh, what we're going to do is throw it into a whole bunch of curry powder, uh, which is going to turn it yellow and like turmeric yellow anyway. So it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, but I have done this something similar uh, while making, uh, I think I was doing hash browns once, uh, and I was paying attention and I just left them out. Uh, and then the hash browns turn pink, uh, because even if you fry a hash brown, uh, it's still, even if you get like a good golden brown crispy uh, exterior, it's still gonna look pink. It's oxidized. So, uh, but no, it doesn't doesn't go bad. Nothing nothing's gonna spoil or anything. So you'll be fine. Uh, but especially so today we're working with this is just four russets. Uh, but if you're working with a lot, uh, say if you're trying to feed like 10, 15 people, uh, then you need to definitely that needs to get into some water. Otherwise, you're gonna have some potatoes. Uh, so here's our potatoes what we're going to do is fill this up with some water. Uh, this is going to do actually this serves two different purposes here. Uh, the first thing as we just mentioned uh, is it's going to prevent the potatoes from oxidizing so it's going to keep it from turning pink. Uh, but the other second and also very important thing that's going to happen uh, and this is also why I, I'm going to contradict myself too. Uh, what also is going to happen is, is that essentially what we're doing is rinsing off the starch that's stuck to the potato. So 
if you've ever worked with potato starch before, you use it as a thickening agent uh, and a lot of things, same way that we use cor uh, corn starch a lot. Uh, we don't want that starch to stick to our potatoes because if it stays stuck to that potato, uh, what's going to happen is it's eventually going to start sticking to itself. So if we leave that starch stuck, uh, once it goes into the curry, uh, the potatoes are going to stick to each other. So if you've ever had this issue where you're working with a curry uh, and the potatoes seem, they all start like clumping together so they have this cohesive property where they just sort of like stay uh, instead. Even though you chop them, they're still stuck together. Uh, that's because you haven't rinsed off the starch yet. Uh, so what I like to do, especially in our scenario today where we're going to be using it in a long cook, uh, is that we want to rinse off that starch. So even if we weren't going to soak these, uh, we do still want to rinse them, which is going to be very useful. So, uh, so the reason that I mention this is the one scenario where we don't want that to happen is if you're making hash browns, uh, because that starch is the same thing that's going to keep your hash browns bound together. So without that starch, uh, if you rinse that starch off of your hash browns uh, and then you go and uh, put it on the griddle, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to just start falling apart. So I, what I always think of is kind of uh, very rem reminiscent to me of, of like frozen hash browns or like IHOP or Denny's hash browns, uh, where if you like you get it served, uh, and even though it is in the pancake, it's still like kind of like flaking apart. Uh, it doesn't really have a binding agent. Uh, that's because the starch in the potatoes is missing. Uh, so the as even though I just when you're wearing them in hash browns, you want those uh, to be soaked in water. Uh, the downside is that you're going to be removing that starch. So usually, actually, what, um, more lately, what I've been doing when I work with hash browns uh, is I like to just work really, really fast <laughs> and just, just like finish uh, shredding the potatoes and then literally just throw them straight onto the griddle. Uh, and if you work fast enough, you can avoid that from happening. But uh, if you're not working fast enough, you're eventually going to have to start uh, getting that stuff in some water. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not meant to wash cheese. I don't know what that means. All right. Uh, next up, so what we're chopping up right now is this is some chicken thigh. Uh, you don't have to use chicken thigh. You can use chicken breast if you want. Uh, you don't even have to use chicken. You could use uh, probably use like lamb. You probably I think you could probably do it with beef. That would work. Uh, any it will work fine. Uh, I've done this, I think, one version of this recipe that I've done uh, at least once on this live stream. Oh, there's a tip. Thank you. Let's meet this. Uh, what? Thank you, Michael. That's cool. Uh, I didn't even know that you can tip on YouTube. Uh, one version that I've definitely done uh, is uh, with tofu. That, that works really, really well. Uh, at this point, honestly, you could use whatever kind of protein that you want. And it's going to be very tasty. Uh, because specifically because we're going to be long cooking it so it's not going to make um, a huge difference what kind of protein that you're using because it's all going to be infused with whatever it is that you're long cooking so uh, for our purposes today that we're using this is some uh, chicken thigh uh, which is going to work real nice all right so here's our chicken Uh, for our chicken, though, uh, what we're going to do is a real quick marinade. Uh, I'm not going to get super fancy with this marinade today because I'm feeling lazy. Uh, this is just, that's four tablespoons of soy sauce and some white pepper, which appears to be in a shaker bottle. So that's uh, what, what I usually like to do is measure out that should be half a teaspoon of white pepper. Uh, it's in a shaker bottle today, so I'm not sure that it's on a quarter teaspoon or so. Uh, then the very last thing that we're going to add here, this is going to be about half a teaspoon of cornstarch. Uh, for the same reason, we add this to every marinade that you probably see me doing in wok fries. Uh, it's going to really just keep uh, our chicken from turning rubbery in our wok fry, which is going to be very, very useful today uh, because we're going to be cooking on pretty high heat. 
uh, which means that if you cook it uh, without that cornstarch, uh, you're eventually going to get very, very rubbery chicken on the exterior while the chicken on the interior still remains uncooked. Uh, oh, does white pepper have MSG in it? Uh, that's, I've seen differing opinions about it. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Chinese white pepper, when you buy it in Chinese food stores, uh, it definitely contains white pepper. Uh, it doesn't say it on the ingredients, uh, but when I taste it, it, to me, it definitely has the taste of white pepper. And I have for sure come across white pepper uh, that is mixed with MSG. So uh, I've seen differing opinions on it, though. Uh, definitely the stuff that you find in like American grocery stores, like Safeway and stuff, uh, you don't see it uh, on the label. Uh, but I have uh, found in many of the like Chinese grocery stores where you get white pepper, uh, it does contain MSG. So um, seem like I'm not sure. That to answer your question, I'm not sure. I keep, I keep seeing different differing results every time that I search this too. <laughs> Good question though. All right, last up, what we're gonna do is assemble essentially a sauce base here. Uh, this is what I like to do, especially for our recipe today. Uh, I like to get this going off heat because we're working with miso paste and that miso paste is going to pump up on us if we try and toss it straight in. Uh, so what we're doing, this is starting off with our liquid ingredients. This is uh, four tablespoons of soy sauce plus two tablespoons of mirin. Uh, mirin, by the way, is a Japanese uh, rice vinegar, which is pretty sweet uh, and to me a little bit bitter. Uh, so good to pay attention to uh, when you're using that mirin. You're essentially adding quite a bit of sugar. Uh, then next up, this is four tablespoons, a whole quarter cup. Yeah, whole quarter cup of. Uh, dry sake, which is nice. It's gonna give us this nice brightness. Uh, last up, or second to last up, this is a single tablespoon of oyster sauce. Uh, that's gonna give us some nice, like, caramel brininess. Uh, and then finally, last up, this is what essentially should be white miso paste. Uh, today, what we're working with, I mentioned this earlier in the stream too. Uh, today, what we're working with is actually not white miso paste or miso paste at all. Uh, what we're using today is doenjang. Uh, doenjang, if you're not familiar, comes from Korean cuisine. It's essentially gochujang uh, that has not been spiced. Uh, to, me, uh, to me, and I think uh, the common consensus is that it is more or less just miso paste. Uh, so I have gotten in the habit of using it interchangeably uh, of late, mostly, mostly of late because I just forgot to buy miso paste, so here we are. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do this yourself, uh, but to me, as far as I can tell, uh, it tastes pretty similar, so we're going to be okay. Uh, I probably would not try and do this with uh, gochujang, though, it's going to be too spicy. Yeah. Uh, all right, so most importantly, probably the whole reason why we're assembling this off heat instead of straight into our wok, uh, you'll notice that our miso paste is coming in big old clumps, which is not going to be very useful. Uh, if that goes into our wok, it's not going to come apart on us. Uh, so we want to make sure before it heads to the wok uh, is grab yourself a whisk. This is just a fork. And um, we're going to go through and break up those large clumps on before we head over to the stove. Yeah. Cool. So over on the stove, I think we're done with done cutting. Yeah, I think we're done cutting. So over on the stove, I've got my wok. This is going to get heating up. Um, we're going to go for pretty hot uh, wok temperatures today. What we'll happened to our camera? There we are. Sorry, we lost Reddit. All right, so over on the stove, I've got my wok heating up. We're going to get this going. Uh, we want a pretty hot heat today, so what we're going to do uh, is we're going to start off by searing our chicken, so that chicken is going to go in. Uh, very, very first, we're going to give it a two-minute sear, uh, and that's going to give us these nice crispy bits of chicken. 
Uh, then we're gonna toss it. Hopefully, if we toss it correctly, we should get some nice block hay and set things on the fire, uh, which is more than just fancy. It's also very useful in uh, developing smokiness in your chicken. Uh, then what we're gonna do uh, is we're gonna reset our wok. We're not gonna remove anything uh, because we actually don't need to in our case today. Uh, but we're gonna reset our wok uh, and then add everything else in. So those carrots, those that, uh, the carrots, the uh, potatoes, and then all of our wet ingredients. And we're also gonna add, I think it's like a whole half cup of water, two cups of water, sorry. Uh, all of that's gonna go in and then we're gonna basically just long cook from there. Uh, and that's gonna give us this nice like tender and like um, tender bit of curry. Cool. Uh, so this, by the way, uh, one of my favorites uh, for like kind of running through how to use a wok and how like how adaptable a wok is, uh, all of the different ways that you can use a wok, uh, and uh, uh, basically just woks aren't just for high heat cooking, uh, which lots of, that's very common misnomer is that you can only cook on high heat in a wok, which is absolutely not true. All right, so uh, into our wok, this is going to be this is four tablespoons of grapeseed oil that we're using today. Uh, mostly because I forgot to buy peanut oil and I'm probably not going to go out and buy peanut oil at this point because we have grapeseed oil. This camera is kind of crooked. There we go. Alright, so then in first, going in first is our chicken. Uh, you, we are not, as you might notice, we're not just going to drop the whole chicken into the wok here. Uh, we're going to add these as going in a piece at a time. Uh, and this is achieving a couple of things. The main thing that it's achieving right now uh, is that we're not dumping a whole bunch of liquid into the wok uh, because there's all of this soy sauce going on here. Uh, if we toss that straight into the wok, uh, that liquid is going to start um, uh, combusting with the oil. Uh, and once cold liquid makes contact with hot oil, uh, you have very, very splattery um, dangerous things happen in your wok, which is not great. So, avoid adding that liquid as much as possible. Uh, but the other also very important thing that's happening here uh, is that by uh, adding this one piece at a time, uh, we can make sure that the chicken at no point starts uh, sitting on top of itself. So we want to make sure uh, that we have good solid contact with the wok with each piece of chicken that's going to help us uh, get this nice sear going. Uh, and that's essentially uh, one of the critical elements behind how to sear that chicken. Uh, if, you're, if you have chicken stacked on top of itself, it's not going to sear. It's just going to, uh, you're going to have a nice steamed piece of chicken, which is not really what we're after today. Yeah. So we're going to let this go. This should go for a full two minutes. Uh, undisturbed. What, what we are doing, although we are not tossing the wok, that's very, very important. Uh, if we toss uh, and start shuffling things around, uh, then we're going to ruin that sear. But what we are doing, I'm going back and forth uh, and just giving this wok a little bit of a rotation. Uh, and that's just kind of like moving that oil around to make sure uh, that the parts of the chicken that are on this exterior here uh, are getting nice and coated in that oil. Because without that oil, it's not going to sear. Uh, you're just going to end up burning your chicken, which is not good. Cool. Uh, hello to everyone just tuning in. We have uh, 20, 40 seconds to introduce myself. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, today we're cooking up a Japanese white miso curry, which is loosely inspired by a curry found in San Francisco uh, at a spot called Nazar Cafe. Uh, if you're looking for the recipe, those always live over on my YouTube channel, which if you're watching on Reddit, that's the YouTube channel at the bottom of the screen. Lots of fun stuff coming out. Uh, those recipes, they're out every Friday, so many Fridays ago was the recipe for this uh, curry that we're cooking through right now. Uh, but we've got new stuff coming up every Friday. Uh, so this Friday, as in tomorrow coming up, uh, we're going to make a raboki, which is a form of tokboki, uh, loosely inspired by the one seen on Squid Games, which is fun. Alright. So here's two minutes, we're going to start shuffling. There's our wake. Uh, Totally not necessary. You don't have to set that on fire if you don't want to. 
Uh, I always worry about setting my camera on fire when I do that. But uh, but if you are trying to do it, essentially what we're doing is I'm tilting the wok to one side, uh, and that's essentially igniting the cooking oil uh, in our wok. But again, not necessary. It just looks really cool. Uh, but it also imparts a nice bit of smokiness to our chicken, uh, which is very tasty. Looks delicious. Yeah, thank you. So uh, at this point, we're going to move on. Uh, our chicken does not have to finish cooking through. We often talk about this. Uh, but because we're going to be long cooking for a whole 30 minutes or so, uh, we don't have to finish cooking that chicken through uh, because uh, we're going to be doing more cooking right now. Uh, so this chicken, I would probably say, is probably around like 80-85% cooked through. That's going to be just plenty of cooking. So in the meantime, I'm moving on. This is our aromatics. That's my garlic, my ginger, and the whites of our green onions. Uh, so you'll notice what I did do is I shuffled the chicken to one side uh, so that we can get these aromatics in good solid contact with that wok oil. Uh, and that's going to bloom out those the aromatic qualities that we're looking for here right now. You would just eat it yourself? Yeah. Just the chicken looks pretty good, honestly. Alright. So once those aromatics are nice and fragrant, we want to use our nose when you start smelling garlic and ginger. Uh, you can go ahead and let that combine. Uh, then what we're going to do is the exact same thing, but instead... Uh, we're going to do the exact same thing, but with our dry spices today. So today uh, we have three dry spices that we're going to be using. Uh, if you want, you can probably get away with just doing this whole thing with just curry powder uh, because curry powder more or less contains all of the things that we're about to add. Um, but we're going to do the same thing here, so I'm moving everything to one side. Uh, and that's going to expose all of this nice cooking oil going on right here. This is what we're looking for. And we're adding... So then what we're going to do, same thing, is we're going to make sure that our dry spices make good solid contact with that hot oil. Uh, so that's two tablespoons of curry powder going in. Uh, followed by, this is half a teaspoon, maybe a teaspoon of turmeric powder. Uh, and then what I like to add, you don't have to add this, this is definitely out of place. Uh, but that's about half a teaspoon of garam masala. Curry powder, by the way, is a spice blend, so it contains most of these things already. Uh, so you absolutely don't have to include that turmeric. Uh, it's definitely in your curry powder. That's what's making your curry powder yellow. Uh, because it just gives us a little bit more fragrance. Uh, then what we're doing is the exact same thing. We're just letting that uh, get cooking with the hot oil. Uh, and then once it starts becoming fragrant, we're letting that combine. Uh, then finally, once that's all nice and combined, I'm adding all right, my root veggies next. That's our carrots. Here's our potatoes going in. Uh, then I'm following up. That's going to be two cups of water. Hot water. There we go. Here's our water going in. Uh, if you have it, you could also be using stock at this point. I like to include usually half a cup of stock. Uh, I can't find chicken stock today, so... Uh, today we're just using water, so that's essentially two and a half cups of water. Uh, and then finally, our very last ingredient is going to be our sauce base. Uh, so that's our white miso, this is the soy sauce, mirin, and oyster sauce. Oh, and sake. Uh, which we uh, assembled that off heat. You absolutely don't have to do that off heat. Uh, what the main reason why we assembled that off heat uh, is because it contains some miso paste. Uh, and that miso paste has a tendency to clump up. So if we were to throw that straight into the wok, uh, you would get big old chunks of miso paste that you would have to start breaking apart on heat. 
uh, which is not not the greatest thing to have to do on heat. Uh, but if you uh, don't mind doing that, you can absolutely just toss that stuff straight in. All right, and then the very last thing that I like to do when we're long cooking uh, is I'm going to add, that's my wok ring going to be going in. Uh, and that's essentially just making sure that our wok stops rolling around, which is generally a problem when you have a round bottom wok like this one. Once all of that water is in the wok, we're going to let that come back up to a boil uh, and then bring it down to a simmer. So we're uh, basically uh, have our wok. It's still at very, very high heat right now. Uh, and essentially what we're trying to do is bring that wok, uh, the contents of our wok to a boil here. And then once it reaches the boil, then we're going to bring it down and let it simmer for about 10 minutes. All right, in the meantime, we're gonna go back over here and then we're gonna assemble one last thing, which I always forget to do somehow. Uh, and this is gonna be our cornstarch slurry, which is uh, exactly as the name implies, we're essentially going to be uh, combining, this is gonna be two tablespoons of cornstarch uh, with some water. Uh, and essentially what we're going to be using this for is to thicken up our curry. Uh, prior to adding this cornstarch, you'll notice that our, our curry is going to be pretty loose uh, and wet. Uh, and, or not obviously wet, but pretty loose and kind of liquidy. Uh, have more of the consistency of water because that's basically what it is. Uh, once we add that cornstarch, it's going to start thickening things up. Uh, you absolutely don't have to use cornstarch. I've seen, uh, even in Chinese cuisine alone, many different things used for that. I've seen tapioca starch, I've seen potato starch used. Uh, in uh, more of the European uh, cooking uh, context, you might see things like flour used. Uh, that's generally what a roux, essentially what a roux is in French cooking. Uh, all of these things are essentially achieving the same purpose. We're essentially just trying to get uh, that curry to thicken up uh, and just sort of get that nice co cohesive sauce formed. Uh, so, uh, again, today we're using cornstarch, but use whatever starch that you have. Uh, it is very useful in, for your gluten-free friends because it is a gluten, uh, a gluten-free option. So we're gonna, what we're doing here right now, we're holding back two different things. The first thing uh, is our onions. You'll remember that we chopped these onions, but we're holding them back. Uh, the reason that we're holding those onions back today uh, is because they are very, very delicate. They're a lot more delicate than everything else that's in the wok, uh, which means that if you were to throw those in right now, uh, it, they're gonna start giving up all of their water, uh, which is probably gonna taste very similar because you're gonna impart lots of oniony flavor. Uh, but if you want those onions to still retain some form of like uh, structure, you're going to want to hold those back as long as you possibly can. Usually I like to hold them back until the last like two or three minutes of our long cook. Uh, and that's just to make sure that they don't start falling apart because they're so delicate. Uh, then the other thing that we're holding back right now uh, is our cornstarch. And by the way, the other, uh, so we're holding back, that's our onions and our cornstarch. Uh, and then the last thing that we're also not adding yet, you might have noticed, uh, is that we have not added any salt whatsoever. So that's also very, very important. Uh, the reason that we're holding back these three things uh, is because we want that curry to be reduced before we add stuff. So especially with that cornstarch, but also with that salt too, uh, is that you don't want to do any seasoning uh, until that curry is reduced. Because if you season before it reduces, uh, then it's going to taste like it's under seasoned. But as it reduces, uh, it becomes more concentrated. And then once it's more concentrated, uh, you may or may not have added too much salt at that point if you already seasoned. So uh, let that curry reduce. And then once it reaches the reduction that you're looking for, uh, then start seasoning because uh, you can always add more salt, but you can't add, you can't remove salt. Removing salt is a lot harder to do. So. Boiling, almost boiling. Cool, yeah. Uh, yeah, so like I always mention is that if you're working with a reduction based dish like we are today, uh, make sure you hold off all on that seasoning until the very, very end. Uh, when you're just before you're ready to start serving, uh, then we're going to add that salt and then uh, adjust to taste from there. Cool. 
Yeah. So, like we mentioned earlier, you notice that the potatoes, we're really not that worried about oxidizing our potatoes today. Uh, because, number one, because they're already covered in oil or covered in water already. Uh, but also, number two, is that because they're long cooking in curry powder, uh, which means that they're going to turn yellow anyway. So, if they had turned pink, probably wouldn't have been that, end, that much of the end of the world. So we're going to let this long cook, that's going to go for uh, probably another like five minutes or so. Uh, essentially what we're waiting for at this point is we're just paying attention to the texture of our potatoes uh, and carrots, those are the two main things that we're looking for. Uh, once they're nice and tender, we're uh, essentially going to be ready to eat. Um, so we're trying to make sure that those carrots are cooked all the way through. Uh, usually I look for about like 80%, so if they're like uh, not quite fork tender, but like pork tender and you still have to like push the pork in a little bit. Uh, that's when we're going to add our onions because that's going to be in the last like three minutes or so of our cook time. But at this point, uh, if you are willing uh, to long cook at this point, you could let this thing go for as long as you really want. Uh, I saw at least one person mentioned it on the stream on, thir on Tuesday, uh, is that uh, you could long cook it. They long cooked it for a whole hour. Uh, today we're probably going to do it for maybe 15-20 minutes, but... Um, the longer that you let it cook, uh, the tastier it will get. So it really just depends on like how much foresight did you have to like how early did you start? Yeah. How long to cook the potatoes? Yeah, that's a good question. So it depends on how you chop the potatoes. Um, so if you chop them really thin, uh, so you can think of it this way: is like when you cook hash browns because they're shredded. Uh, hash browns cook really, really quickly. You could. Uh, probably cook a pancake of hash browns in like maybe like under five minutes probably less than that uh, Because they're chopped so thinly uh, they become tender very very quickly So I it's also like important to remember that a potato is raw uh, a potato is edible in its raw stage anyway So we're not paying attention to is it cooked through uh, we're paying attention to is like is its texture uh, The texture that we're looking for so uh, it depends on how you cut it So if you cut it and they're really really small uh, so if you like large or like small diced your, uh, uh, potatoes, uh, then they probably cook through in like maybe five minutes, maybe even less than that because they're chopped so small. Uh, for our potatoes today, because we ended up large dicing those, uh, those will probably take closer to like 10 minutes uh, in a long cook like this. Uh, but because just because they're cooked through does not mean that you have to remove it uh, So I see like lots of people also talk about this with chicken too uh, Is that in the long cook you're worried about overcooking things? Uh, that's not really gonna happen in, in the long cook. That's kind of the whole point of the long cook uh, So you could let it go for as long as you want uh, But uh, we're ma mainly paying attention to is like the texture of the potato So we want to as once we see the w the main thing I'm looking for uh, I guess two things that I'm looking for is I'm watching the the reduction of our sauce here. So um, This is still pretty uh, pretty liquidy. Uh, we're also like relatively reaching a boil here uh, And then we're gonna let some of this water boil off uh, and then once it boils off then we're gonna start paying attention to I'm gonna get a fork uh, and we're gonna tech check those potatoes and make sure that they're cooked all the way through uh, and that's when we're, we're when we're, we'll know. Usually that's about 10 minutes though. I can cook, yeah. You can absolutely cook high. Yeah. I'm not actually sure if you're allowed to do that on Reddit. That's all differing opinions. Maybe you can smoke pot on Reddit. So we're gonna let this go. That will probably, I think that's gonna need another like maybe five minutes, maybe a little bit less than that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hello to everyone just tuning in. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, we're here every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 PST uh, with new recipes coming out over on my YouTube channel every Friday. Uh, so last Friday we came out with a Chinese soup dumpling, which is a shaolin ball. Uh, we cooked that. That one took a long time. I think that recipe took me a whole two days, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. Uh, that was last Friday. Friday before that, I think we did a pantry basics episode, which was essentially just running through uh, all of the stuff that's in this pantry behind me and kind of like talking through what those things are. Uh, this Friday coming up, uh, as in tomorrow, is going to be a recipe for a Korean raw bulky. 
uh, which is a form of tteokbokki, which is loosely inspired by the dish that you probably, hopefully, I think everyone saw it uh, on Squid Games. This is in the first episode of Squid Games, so we're going to be cooking through that and kind of taking a look at what rapokki is, uh, what tteokbokki is, and kind of like what the difference is. Uh, so that's coming out this Friday, and so I'm really excited for it. We're also going to be cooking through that live on Tuesday, so that's going to be real fun. Uh, Dokboki is one of my favorites. Uh, it's also an interesting challenge because it has this very, very similar uh, di uh, similar ingredient uh, called Niangao that comes from Chinese food. Uh, it is basically the exact same thing, except that it's chopped slightly differently uh, and used in very, very different contexts. So in Chinese food, we use Niangao in stir fries. Uh, in Korean food, you mainly use uh, and thing or dok. Uh, in things like stews and long cooks and stuff like that. So, so all that stuff coming up uh, very, very soon. Uh, so if you're interested in stuff like that, definitely head over to the YouTube channel, check out what's going on over there. Oh, the music's too high. I could definitely turn that down. I can't hear the music, by the way, so if it is too high, please let me know uh, because I have no idea. <laughs> so, uh, Cool, yeah, so all that stuff living over on the YouTube channel, so if you're interested in stuff like that, definitely hop over and check out what's going on. Uh, we have a couple of series that are in progress, so that Squid Games recipe uh, is going to be part of a whole series that we've been doing where we've been reproducing stuff uh, from TV and film, so there's a lot of a lot of fun recipes that have been coming up on that now. Uh, what else? Uh, we have a, uh, another series uh, that's entirely dedicated to reproducing foods from the San Francisco Bay Area food scene. Uh, so our Shalom Bao recipe that came out last Friday that was uh, in, uh, inspired by a dish that you, or the Shalom Bao that you can find here in Oakland Chinatown at a restaurant called Ming's Tasty. Uh, there's another fun series that we've been doing, haven't done one in, oh, probably have one coming up, uh, that's entirely dedicated to reproducing foods from Chinese American cuisine. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of Panda Express recipes and like uh, P.F. Chang's recipes and in that series, uh, that's one of my favorites, it's probably the most interesting series that I like, I like to dig into. Uh, where we like take apart what those dishes are and like kind of identify what the American qualities are of those things, uh, which is always very interesting with stuff like a, like general sauce chicken or honey sesame chicken. Uh, we did a Mongolian beef, things like that. Very interesting because a lot of those dishes don't have origins in Chinese food. Uh, what we're essentially just doing is deconstructing American food uh, and figuring out what about it is American and what about it is actually Chinese, uh, and what it looks like if we were to try and reproduce those dishes through the lens of like. Uh, real Chinese, traditional Chinese cooking, uh, which is super interesting. So, uh, stuff like that living over on the YouTube channel. So, if you're interested, uh, definitely make your way over and check out what's going on. Lots of fun stuff coming up. Cool. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, we're working our way up to 5,500 subscribers too. So, if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal, uh, please hop over, feed Ham Charles. Uh, Ham Charles, the hamster that eats uh, anytime that somebody subscribes. He's very hungry. So our curry is getting pretty close. This looks like it's going to need maybe another like two, three minutes and then we're going to be ready to add those onions. Uh, do I have a live stream? Good question. Thank you for asking, Michael. Uh, yes, we do have a live stream schedule, uh, which reminds me I probably should have mentioned that. Uh, this live stream that's going on behind me is going to our YouTube channel, which also is where our second live stream is. So if you're watching on Reddit, uh, that's where that one is going is to YouTube. Uh, that YouTube channel also has a whole schedule of everything that I'm going to be cooking. Uh, I think it goes out like three or four weeks. I think it goes out four or five weeks actually now. Uh, so if you want to find out what we're going to be cooking next, uh, that's a good place to head over to. So generally, uh, not always, but generally if we're cooking, the recipe that comes out on Friday uh, is something that can be made from, for dinner and is something that doesn't take two whole days to cook. Uh, I'll probably going to be uh, attempting to cook that on, on the Tuesday following. So this uh, this Friday, as in tomorrow, is going to be our raw bulky recipe. Uh, and then Tuesday following it, so next Tuesday, uh, we're going to be cooking through that live. So it's going to be fun. The exceptions being that like if it's really, really difficult or not something that I can eat for dinner. Uh, so like our shalom bao recipe, which took two days to cook uh, and is like not really a dinner thing. <laughs> uh, we didn't cook through that live because it would be way too hard. Uh, and I would probably kill myself if I tried to cook that live uh, because it is so hard to make. Shalom Bao, very, very difficult thing to make. Uh, definitely uh, too much pressure to try and do it live. Uh, but we did do our, uh, we did do the shumai recipe uh, live. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Good stew, yeah. I guess that's what a curry is, a stew. Alright, let's check these potatoes.
Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Yeah, I think we're right at, that's about 80% cooked through. So essentially what we're looking for is our potatoes, they're fork tender so we can get the fork into it. Uh, but it does take a little bit of pressure, so we have to like push the fork in. Uh, that's generally the texture that we're looking for uh, because it means that we're about 80% away. Uh, you absolutely can just keep cooking. Potatoes are very, very resilient. Uh, you can leave those long cooking for uh, another like six, eight, ten hours. I think you could cook it for ten hours. I've never tried to cook it for ten hours, to be honest. Uh, but you could, you could let it go for as long as you want. Uh, those potatoes are so resilient that they're going to hold together nice and well for you. Uh, for our onions, though, we're adding those in. Uh, what's most important once those onions are in the wok uh, is that the onions only can go for another like three or four minutes. Once in, uh, you're on a clock. So if they, once, once those onions are in our wok now, uh, we only have about three or four minutes until uh, they start disintegrating and then you're going to lose your onions. Off. So I'm adding my onions here and then what we're going to do is I'm paying attention to the reduction of our curry. Uh, I think that needs to be reduced by another like maybe another 5% or so and that's going to give us this nice cohesive sauce for us. Yeah, Shalambao will be a long live stream because you have to wait for the dough to relax and the gelatin to harden. Uh, the dough, like, so the gelatin, the aspic uh, alone would take, uh, I think that took, the aspic alone took like two hours uh, because you have to, you have to cook it. It has to cook for a whole two hours. Uh, and then uh, once it's cooked, it also has to uh, chill for a whole eight hours. So it probably, that would probably involve like a swap. I would have to like make it prior uh, and then swap that out. Uh, and then I think just wrapping the dough uh, just making the the, uh, the dumpling wrappers alone was like another like two hours, uh, which I had to do twice because I forgot that uh, if you if you once you roll those dump, dumpling wrappers, uh, they'll start sticking to each other. So I stacked them on top of each, each other, uh, uh, foolishly assuming that if I just lined the the wrappers with a little bit of flour, uh, that they would release from each other, but they did not. Uh, and then I had to throw them away, which which sucked. That that was. That was a whole two hours of my life that were <laughs> wasted. Uh, and then I had to make those wrappers twice. Yeah. Alright, we're almost there. I think that's gonna need another like two minutes or so and we'll be ready to go. 